So now that we've established the legend that Charles Darwin was, you might be asking yourself, what is the evidence behind all of these things that we just stated? How do we know any of this is even influential today? And how do we know that it runs true today? We're going to continue the next couple of flowcharts by entitling them Evidence for Evolution, and this first one will be Roman numeral 1. So we'll entitle this Evidence for Evolution, EVO, and Roman numeral 1. So the first basic piece of evidence we can actually look at is not natural selection, but it's actually something we do as um, individuals of the human race, something called artificial selection. Because artificial selection has the same idea as natural selection, but it's just our version of it. It's our way of uh, what we call selective breeding. Isn't that what natural selection is? Those individuals with the best characteristics will survive and reproduce at a better rate than those with less favorable characteristics. Isn't that what we do as humans when we selectively breed animals? What we do is we usually modify in artificial selection, um, a useful species. Something like a cow. We modify it so that um, it we produce cows that make the most milk or chickens that lay the most eggs or lay the biggest eggs, the best eggs. This is our own manipulation. And in this situation, instead of nature being the agent of selection, the agent of selection, the people who select, the thing that selects are us, humans. Humans select those species that are most useful to us. And thus, this is something that we see that's very common. It's very common to see in agriculture. The best animals, the best ones that we want, are the ones that have the best traits. This is an exact idea that natural selection has, but just on the artificial scale. So we see this in agriculture. In the artificial scale, in the selection that we do, we selectively breed just like natural selection does, and we see the exact characteristics that natural selection does in the evolution of modifying useful species. Useful species will continue to survive and reproduce. Those that are yes, less useful, the ones that produce less milk or bad eggs, those are the ones that are not going to reproduce. So this is an exact definition of natural selection, just sort of manipulated in our way of selective breeding. We do the same thing with dogs, actually. Dogs are selectively breeded. You want pure breeds, you want certain breeds, and those breeds will be bred more than others because those are the ones that are useful to us, the ones that we like the most, let's say. Um, in addition to that, we also have what we would consider um, direct observations. These are actually This is actually an indirect observation. You have to sort of extrapolate information from this. From this, we have an opposite version, which is really the direct observation of evolutionary change, let's say. These are things that we actually see that tell us that evolution certainly does happen, and it actually happens in the exact way that Mr. Darwin says. One of the most obvious ones in the direct observations of evolutionary change is something known as, and something that's really important in medicine today, something known as antibiotic resistance. This is something you've probably heard of, and it's a big problem right now. Because what happens is, antibiotic resistance is something that bacteria do, and bacteria are individuals. They are living things that are exposed to environments, and they have to evolve. Bacteria have to evolve. They have to adapt to environments. Let's say the environment has antibiotics. You are a human taking antibiotics and the bacteria within you that are causing you to be sick are dying. But what's going to happen is that some of the bacteria, what we would consider natural variants, some bacteria that are the natural variants are going to actually survive. Some of them, just because of a mutation, maybe maybe because they just have better characteristic than their uh, counterpart, survive the antibiotics. Some natural variants, we see this today, we see this very clearly, survive the antibiotics. And because you survive, what do you always think? After survive, you reproduce. And because you survive and reproduce, what have you done? You are going to eventually create, and here's this word again, populations, not individual bacteria, populations of resistant bacteria. 
This is direct observation of evolution, direct observation of resistant bacteria, those with the best characteristics surviving and reproducing because of an environmental constraint. The struggle is real in bacteria, and thus you see evolution of resistant bacteria strains, okay? Populations, that is. Not individual bacteria, but populations of them. So that's a direct observation. Another direct observation comes from um, an exact study, actually, um, and it's actually the idea of a response to an introduced species, okay? What do I mean by this? SPP for species. Well, what we can understand and do as uh, humans is manipulate their certain things. What we can do is move a species, okay? from a native area, okay, from native location, let's say, where it's usually supposed to be, where we usually find it, from its native location to a new location, to a new geologic location, new place on Earth, and see what's going to happen. Because remember, natural selection is highly related to the environment, and the environment has a lack of resources, and there's a struggle. So what happens if you move a species that has adapted well to a native location to a new geologic location? Do you see evolution? Well, the example that we're going to be looking at is something known as the soapberry bug. There's an insect called the soapberry bug, and this was an example that is seen today that shows us evolution does happen. So, the soapberry bug, a bit of background information on the side that we can put here. Um, they have a beak, okay? And that beak is rather hollow. It's a hollow beak, and it's uh, needle-like in shape, okay? Really look at a picture of this. It's really important to really see how it looks. So they have a beak. This bug has a sort of an extension, a beak, and this beak is hollow and needle-like. Thus, it's really good at feeding on seeds. So the soapberry bug feeds on seeds, okay? Easier to remember. Uh, rhymes, right? So it feeds on seeds. It has a beak that allows it to feed on seeds. Good adaptation. Yes. Okay. So let me give you a native population. That native population will be found in what we consider southern Florida. This is true. This is actually where they're found. So if we look at the native population in southern Florida, what we notice is the following. We notice that they like to eat what are called balloon vine i got to write really small here, seeds. These soapberry bugs eat balloon vine seeds, and these balloon vine seeds are found within what we call plump with in plump um, and round fruits. Okay, so seeds are always found in fruits, right? Um, and so these pillberry bugs, I mean not pillberry, soapberry bugs, actually have to dig. They have to sort of put their seed, their, um, their beak, really deep into this fruit because it's, the fruit is plump and round. It's a big fruit. The seeds are all the way on the inside of it. So the beak, you would imagine, is long or short. In this situation, the beak is probably long. So we see long beaks in the southern Florida soapberry bug beak population. Okay. So there's a long beak because the fruit is rather large and the seeds that are within it called balloon vine seeds are harder to get so they've adapted well. They've made long beaks for themselves in the southern Florida population. But what do we notice in the central Florida population? There's actually a population of soapberry bugs in central Florida. And the environment is different. The resources are different. This was the resource right here, right? And this resource is limited. There's not an unlimited amount of fruit. Thus, you adapt to this limited resource by getting long beaks. Central Florida, almost the same exact story. But in Central Florida, there are no balloon vine seeds. There's actually something called golden rain tree seeds, okay? Golden rain tree seeds. Okay, not balloon vine seeds. These are golden rain tree seeds, and these are within flatter fruits. Okay, so I'm going to write this down really small, within flatter fruits. So these fruits are not plump, okay? They're not big and round. They're flatter, and thus the seeds of these fruits are closer to the surface. And if the seeds are closer to the surface of these flat fruits, beaks are going to be long or short. Adaptation, natural selection says the beaks will be short because you would be expending unnecessary energy to have a long beak, right? 
all you need is a short beak and natural selection says you know what short beaks are what's needed and that's what will let's say come about okay that's not technically how natural selection works don't think of it like that just think of it as flatter fruits short beaks plump round fruits long beaks okay i don't want to confuse you so basic idea behind it here why am i talking about a useless bug well i'm talking about a bug because there's a prediction that we as scientists can make and our prediction remember move a species from native location to new geologic location what's our prediction our prediction is the following and we've said it already natural selection ns will result in shorter okay will result in shorter beaks in CF Central Florida population of soapberry bugs and is that what we saw is that our conclusion yes it is that conclusion clearly shows us that evolution through natural selection happened in southern Florida and right next to it, central Florida. We didn't even have to move that far. All we saw was a change in resource, thus a change in adaptation through natural selection. So basically, we can state that if you change, if you change, because natural selection is all about variation, if you change food size, if you change food size, you get evolution via natural selection because natural selection selected those beaks that are most optimal for Central Florida and Southern Florida populations. You get evolution via natural selection for matching uh, beak size. And what I mean by matching, I mean fruit is flat, short beaks. Fruit is plump, long beaks, right? That's what we mean by a response to an introduced species. So this is a very clear-cut example of evolution and evidence for evolution through natural selection. Natural selection selects long beaks, selects short beaks. If you switch them around, you will have a um, sort of a, a variation that's not going to work with the environment. It's not tailored to the environment. So lots of information I just threw out at you. Let me give you a very short summary of what to understand from this flowchart. In summary, you have to remember that natural selection, this is something people don't realize, is a process of, and I'm going to write this in big bold letters, editing. Natural selection is process of editing, not, absolutely not. It is not creating, okay? So what do I mean by this? I told you that soapberry bugs have a beak, okay? They have a beak. Natural selection edits the beak to either be long or short depending on the resource, depending on the environment, and thus it's an editing process. Did the soapberry bug randomly evolve a beak and then happen to be a long beak? No, it started with something and natural selection is a process that edited what started with what it started with. It acts on things. It does not create. It's not a creation process. That's critical to understand. And then we have to understand, because of this editing, natural selection is absolutely dependent on two critical things. It's dependent on time, meaning that it takes time for it to work, and it's dependent on place. It's dependent on place, i.e. southern Florida versus central Florida, i.e. balloon vine seeds versus golden tree seeds. Place would be otherwise known as environment. Time and place just sounds a little nicer to me. So that's our summary. This is our initial evidence for evolution. We'll continue looking at, continue look at our evidence for evolution in the next couple of flowcharts.